Not very long ago, in the bottom right-hand corner of England, there was an old cowshed, a barn and four pigsties. And there, more than 40 years ago, Oliver Postgate, that's me, and Peter Fermin, the artist and illustrator, started to make small films for children's television. I am logging the dog. And Bagpuss was wide awake. That voice of Oliver Postgate must be among the most recognisable voices in, in our British culture. There's something about it that is so kindly and so warm. It draws you in so easily. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> what a tangle of old rubbish. He'd be ankle deep in film, you know, and it had a very characteristic smell to it, you know, you sort of go in there and, and it was to the to the, the untrained eye, complete complete chaos. You know. The most magical saggy old cloth cat in the whole wide world. Always there was something being filmed or some something was always going on. It felt very normal. Being dressing up as a Victorian child didn't seem absurd. <laughs> Really, the way Oliver tells stories and what he's telling the stories about, a lot of it are about people cooperating in a rural or a non-industrial background and reusing things. Yeah, well, it's quite obvious what that is all about. But the heart of Oliver's background was a socialist left-wing background. You can see that that left Labour background is distilled into these little films that he made. After all, what would clangers want with real money? You can't eat it, can you? In terms of their cultural influence and impact, they punch way above their weight. It is the most important, most beautiful, most magical, saggy old <laughs> homemade animations. is a clangor. And that is another clangor. They seem to have a piece of rope. The clangors contained all of the trademark post-Gatian elements, if you like, the things that really, for me, drew me in as a child. Uh, and that was this, this separate world. Soup! They want soup! Better ask Tiny clangor. And here we had this contained world of what appeared to be a family of clangers. Basically, they they just got on with things, but were surrounded by this 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 absurd community of of objects and and peripheral characters, if you like. There was a cloud. There was an iron chicken who was slightly delinquent. There was obviously the soup dragon. The, uh, and uh, the soup wells. A lot, Oliver. I found the world. Oh, and yes. I found the whistle. Yes, oh, the whistle. Yeah, yeah, that's the whistle. This is Major Clanger's whistle. It's a very low register. I hope you understood that. I wonder how I can explain. Funnily enough, you know, I just grew up thinking that was the sound of the clangers. I didn't realise it was a musical instrument. So um, I think probably most people, would, when they hear that swanny whistle, they think it's the clangers. What's absolutely stunning about the clangers is how few words there are in it. So what he's doing, it, if you, if, if you think about it, what he's doing, he's doing mime and he's doing sound. The mime comes from the little woolly clangers and the sound is coming from the swanny whistle. Now I wonder if this machine is going to work. You 
And all the time you see two little clangers, woolly noses going up, looking over there, no sound, and just... <laughs> what the child is doing is reading those images and reading those peculiar sounds of the swanny whistle. And that's staggering because you're, in a sense, you're saying to the child, go ahead, go and do that. You know, you're leaving a space for the child to do the interpreting. So it's very active television. Oh dear, that's not one of his best machines. So they drag it away and try again with something else. It was something that we found um, that we didn't know existed. And, uh, you know, um, after Oliver died, um, we, we, we found these scripts. And uh, this is how Oliver wrote the clangers. So he would narrate this side. This, everything would be written here. And on this side, it actually has what the, uh, the clangers say. Of course, they don't actually speak in the program, so this is what would be whistled with the swanny whistle. So, mm -hmm. hi, where's Charlie? <whistles> you know, and uh, and there was this sort of notorious line which was used in in, in the toys that were made of the clangers, where they say. And he was very pleased about this because what he was actually saying was, um, um, "Oh, damn it." The bee thing stuck again, which is probably the bloody thing stuck again. The Clangers must have been one of the first television shows I ever watched. I like the homemade quality because I, I like that you can look at them and, and work out sort of how they were made and you could recognise the props and bits of the set and you kind of knew how they'd done it and that you might be able to do it yourself. Oh, here are. Oh, oh, yes, that's the one. A skeleton. That's yeah, 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 yeah. How they move. The actual work for it. Ooh. He really comes from blokes in garden sheds fiddling around making things. What are you doing? I'm making a film in the garden shed. I mean, it's... And you can see it in the film. You can hear it in the films. I mean, it really is small films. I mean, it's handmade. As you see, it's made of the same thing as everybody has skeletons of bones and ball joints. These are Mikado on the arms with little bits in between. And um, it's stiff, you see. It stays where it's put. And that, if you imagine that stuffed inside a clanger, you could put his arms exactly where you want. There he goes. He can stand on one foot. Actually, yes. yeah, that's Mother. This is the father of the family, Major Clanger. Um, and that's my... No, that's his second wife. <laughs> his first wife was stolen. <laughs> yeah, BBC had an exhibition in the 60s of the Clangers, but someone pinched Mother Clanger. So after the films were made, we then uh, had an, <laughs> a new marriage <laughs> took place between him and her. So that's his new wife. There was that scene in Doctor Who with the master watching um, watching television, and, and he thought it was a, a life form. It seems to be a rather interesting extraterrestrial life form. Only puppets, you know, for children. Oh. Postgate recognised that the Clangers, ultimately, as well as in being a wonderful storytelling vehicle for children, was also an opportunity to make comment about the world. A 
the time we got to the late 60s at that time, we knew so much more about the rest of the world, the impact of the space race, and the aspiration that we might move beyond the bounds of Earth. The idea that the moon, the stars, the galaxy, the universe was out there and was a challenge for humankind. Of all the stars and moons and planets that shine in the sky, by far the most troublesome is surely this one. This small cloud-covered planet is our Earth, the home of the human race. Oliver set himself apart from the kind of mainstream enthusiasm about technology and about space and about bombs that was going on in the late 50s, 60s and into the 70s. You know, he was a member of CND and you can see at the beginning of the clangers, he is saying, look, when we look at the Earth, it is beautiful just as you know, Apollo and, and Neil Armstrong and the rest looked back and could see the Earth that it's beautiful, but at the heart of what Oliver is saying at the beginning there, this is the most troubled and troublesome planet of all. We have war, we cannot, we are not solving the problems of the world. Satellites, spent rockets, and other unwanted articles litter the orbits of the Earth and the space beyond. Who can say where some of this expensive rubbish may ultimately arrive as it hurtles aimlessly through the universe? Look, it's cracking some more. It's a baby penguin. Yeah, good baby penguin. It's all right. I never knew when I first met Oliver that his dad was a person I'd read in the sixth form, Raymond Postgate and GDH Carl, The Common People. So at the heart of Oliver's background was a socialist left-wing Labour Party. I mean, his grandfather was George Lansbury. This was somebody who led one of the most famous revolts from a, a local council when they fought the cuts, basically, in Poplar. And in fact, quite hard to relate it to the programmes that he made. But actually, when you look at the programmes, it's not that they're socialist propaganda or anything like that. But you can see they're drawing on left-wing labour traditions. Will that do instead of soup? I don't think it will. They can't eat that. Ray was very large. He was a classically educated man who had come into the socialist movement you know, at its inception. And I remember we used to go and stay at the Hadfields, which people described as the Bloomsbury on the Marsh. And I can remember a little fat man who liked to play games but always cheated, who was called H.G. Wells and a rather thin, ratty man whom everybody deferred to, rather, who was actually Bertrand Russell. And um, I had no idea how important these people were, you know. The great thing which all the people at that time seemed to have in common was a sense of having a great future. The world was leading into a socialist-type future in which all, all, all its difficulties would disappear and that they were going to make that future. This is the quality which they had. They were the makers of the future. <laughs> You're quite right there. What a lot of bosh indeed. I've never heard such rubbish. What's the matter with these? Look, these will do. Look, feathers for oars. They reckon it's just a silly digging gold as blowing bubbles. Dartington was a remarkable school. It was an experiment, really, in treating children rationally and affectionately. So, although they had to go to lessons, they, all the staff were known by their Christian names. There was nude swimming in the, in the morning, lots of emphasis on art and drama, and a, a very friendly place.
all of children's literature and all of children's films, they're all informed by an idea that there is some ideal place. And this ideal place may be childhood, it may be the time before there was industry, before there was somehow or other the world got corrupted by us adults. And I can imagine there's quite a link between this bohemian heaven in the garden around Dartington with the kind of worlds that Oliver created in his films. Don't be daft, Fish don't have time off. Everybody has to have some time off, die. Maybe it's time for you to put down your fishing rod and have a snooze in the sun like me. You're making a musical wheel. I was a failed actor. I remained failed for a long time. But I was also worked in a button factory, I did lots and lots of different things, you know. But I was, yes, throughout my life I was launching myself into follies of different sorts, and they would come a cropper and I would dump them. Very interesting. Now what next? In the early 50s, Postgate was involved in all sorts of machine making, and basically he was a, a toy maker, and, and he got into television on the basis, really, of creating what he thought were going to be children's toys. He made a virtuoso pig, for example. And this attracted him to the mechanism of making animation. We were very impressed. There was this gentleman came down from the telly, you know, to ask me to do drawings. Joan always claims that, as my wife Joan always claims, that she noticed that he wore brown shoes with a blue suit and she thought, well, he must be all right then. So <laughs> we were um, content. He had so many ideas. He was full of confidence. He gave me confidence to work for this strange medium called the television. <laughs> He got commissioned to do a series of programs called Alexander the Mouse, and he was very excited about the stories. Alexander was going to be the, the mouse who would be king. In essence, what it was was cut out figures, and magnets would move the figures along from behind. And of course, magnets attract, and suddenly Alexander was bouncing all over the screen as various magnetic poles clashed and so forth. Hands would offer appear, appear on screen during live broadcasts. So it was very primitive, but nevertheless still very charming in its amateur, handcrafted way. All ready? Right then. A pretty, sad, sweet serenade for Mrs. Pogel. One, two... <laughs> My mum was married to Peter Myers, a, a famous uh, uh, theatre writer, and uh, they were splitting up at the time. And um, and so my mum and uh, my dad sort of got it together. And there's a picture of our mother. True. Probably when they first knew each other. Yeah. It's when I used to talk to my father and I used to say, uh, w w what do you think I should do? Dad, I don't know, you know... What shall I do with my life? And he would say to me, well, I didn't know what I, what to do with my life until I met your mother. And I adopted, uh, I immediately, your mother came along with three children and I had to look after three children and, you know, and support the family. And so I just had to get on with it. <laughs> Soup time. Come on, everybody. Soup time. And Oliver then, of course, got his camera and, you know, decided to make... He was fed up with this sort of rather hazardous method of animation, so he decided to make films and he taught himself stop-frame animation, set up his camera in his room and uh, started... Um, thinking of ideas for animation. This was just an ordinary Bolex camera, which wasn't sort of designed to be used as a uh, single-frame camera. And so he rigged it up with Meccano, 
and he also attached an engine at the back here, a motor. That would be the automatic aspect when he got, when that was going or he'd switch it on, he'd have to make the movement and then get back again and make the movement and then get back again. And if, if he made a mistake, you know, his hand would be in there and in the early films it did occasionally sort of uh, make an appearance. So this was the manual control and this was the automatic. The thing to point out with all uh, uh, Oliver's stuff was that he would build everything up from scratch. So, you know, as with the... Uh, this is the flat animation uh, desk you would have where you did eye for the engine or nog in the nog. Mm -hmm. And so he would build everything uh, that he used uh, from scratch well, uh, like and, and then the fix house. the camera in there, you know. We will find it, we will find it, we will stick it with glue, we will find it, we will stick on it, every little bit of it, we will fix it right, new, 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 we will fix it right, new, new, new. He was trying to think of the sort of characters that might be suitable for animation on a table. To avoid legs, legs are a great problem with animation. So he thought wheels, and then he thought, well, wheels, uh, engines, locomotives, where do locomotives come from? Wales. You know, there's a lot of little steam engines in Wales, and so that's how Ivor the Engine was bought. Not very long ago, in the top left-hand corner of Wales, there was a railway. It wasn't a very long railway, or a very important railway but it was called the Merionef and Lanticilli Rail Traction Company Limited, and it was all there was. And in a shed, in a siding, at the end of the railway, lived the locomotive of the Merionef and Lanticilli Rail Traction Company Limited, which was a long name for a little engine, so his friends just called him Ivor. Well, animation wasn't so much an imitation of life, it was a punctuation of conversation. And always, we always stayed on the one who was talking, and it made for a very simple film, which was very clear, and there was no, no unnecessary things going on around yeah. the edges. You know, I wonder sometimes, Di, looking up in the sky, about, uh, well, you know, all life on other planets and that. Oh, yes. There is. If I'm going to say something to you, well, I'll do it. Uh, with a certain amount of gestures, but in between times, I'm completely still, you see. And I've only just made four or five movements then. Mind you, they wouldn't be what I was doing, because I'm, I'm terribly self-conscious at the moment. <laughs> but that was the that was the point. This is how we managed to get through 120 seconds a day, when most studios get through 10 seconds a day. You never move a mouth. Oh, we never haven't had a mouth. We changed expression. We didn't bother with the mouth, because people were watching the hands. I got a book about it. Little green men with pointed heads there. Oh, don't be daft, I. No, it's true. That way we managed to be fairly economical, but actually, in the end, extremely powerful in what we had to say. Just one thumb like that. Listen, Jones, what are you doing with that? I don't know. And there's only three moves in the whole thing. When you land, they look like petrol pumps and say, Take me to you later. <laughs> Never. Yes, may I see what? There's a lot of boat nowadays. Look you. There's one now. What, a little green man? You mm, are flying saucer, so silly. The little green men are inside. Oh, this is an interesting... I remember this was a... Uh, a trip that Oliver and me made to open a, um, a train in Wales. They thought he'd made the magic roundabout, but it turns out he'd made uh, either the engine, but they were happy with that. And they'd called the, called the, um, the, the, uh, the train, uh, uh, Dougal. He was very nervous about, um, Ivor the engine because he does the Welsh accent quite a lot in it. And he was, he was worried that it, you know, that the, 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 the Welsh, um, might sort of take a little bit of kind of umbrage at this, but, um, they translated it into Welsh. <laughs> What's going on over there? The first ones were a bit less successful than the later ones because he made the films and then recorded the sound on top. And that's always a bit 
difficult because you're trying to keep up with the action on the film and your voice and uh, you know it, it didn't work so well but later on he learnt that he should record the soundtrack with the effects and everything and make a sort of radio program first and then uh, the film could be made on very strict lines here well, in this shot you see you see the way he's kind of he's laid every, everything out he'd have his scripts here he then had a sprocket counter where he counted how, counted how many frames so, so you had the first sentence and then a number sort of 16 and then the next sentence 32 and he'd, he'd calibrate the whole thing in that way um, before he started animating and then he'd animate on the bolex which is a counter on the side but here so he'd animate to those numbers and uh, i used to sit next to him and uh, write down the numbers as he called them out oh uh, did you oh right because I, I went up and did that once with him and uh uh, I don't think I ever did it again, actually. Yeah, did I found it a bit sort of boring. <laughs> <laughs> did he pay you? I got a fiver. Ivor's world becomes one, in the top left-hand corner of Wales, of course, that's predicated on the small concerns of being an engine driver, the local relationships with people, the small things that happen that kind of seem to be high crises in, in, in Ivor's world, but nevertheless become these things that everybody collectively can resolve. So those kind of aspects of, of Postgate's world are, yeah, are, are really quite important. But I think what's especially important about it is its Welshness. Oh, this fancy bread look. That's not bread, that's dragon. Oh, so it is, Edwin Jones. Yes, and you will chew on now. Barada. Barada. If we think of Ivor and we think of Oliver and the left-wing tradition, where did some of this left-wing tradition ca come from? It came from, uh, came from Wales. That people who worked in Wales, particularly around the pits, they developed a sense of community that really left-wing Labour people said this is the future, this is we must look to these people and the ideas that they're developing about how we can cooperate and how we can share. Um, and it's quite interesting that he put that into a little children's film. Looking out of Ivor's funnel was a dragon. Not one of your lumping great fairy tale dragons, but a small, trim, heraldic Welsh dragon, glowing red-hot and smiling. Do you know a land of my father's? Oh, yes, of course. Certainly. Very appropriate, if I may say so. Come, ladies and gentlemen. Land of my father's, if you please. Ivor does have this ambition and does indeed fulfil it to, to sing in the in the choir, which of course is the expression of this community coming together with this this single voice and he wants to be part of that. And I think it's quite telling that they hold their choir practices on the railway tracks because Ivor just seems to sort of drive in and they're all assembled, the choir, the whole community are there, uh, with Evans the song, all ready to sing. Morning, Dice Station. Morning, Jones. One thing was was a, yeah, a huge influence on his work was Dylan Thomas, particularly uh, Undermelt Wood. The wood was every tree foot's cloven in the black glad sight of the hunters of lovers. There is a god built garden to me. There is a quality to Dylan Thomas's poetry and Undermelt Wood which is very melancholy and very, uh, has this sort of um, sadness to it, you know. And I think that is um, sort of shot through with all Oliver's work, you know, uh, and makes it stand apart from a lot of other programmes, really, because it does have this, this, this dimension of sadness to it and melancholy. Everybody sang. And high and clear above their voices rang out the voices of the dragons singing their gladness from the heart of their own permanently endowed gas-fired volcano. I think that there is a very strong element of the past in their programmes. 
it's almost sort of like harking back to something that was never there perhaps you know a sadness because it was never there lands of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. In the dark night that is very long, the men of the Northland sit by their great log fires, and they tell a tale. They tell of Noggin, prince of the Nogs, who sailed to the land of the midnight sun to fetch Nuka, princess of the Nooks, to be his queen. My favourite postgate uh, work is Noggin the Nog. I think people encounter postgates work at different times in their lives and one of the things that was hugely appealing for me was the fact that there was this epic model of storytelling in a children's idiom and that in, in that was a villain, a major villain, Nogbad, and he was the first major villain that I discovered on television and really, really embraced and enjoyed. <laughs> there it is at last, the sword of power. I had been to the British Museum drawing and noticed that the, the Isle of Lewis chessmen had marvellous characters and I thought they had a story to tell. It got no further than just outlines and a couple of scripts. Oliver saw it and said this would be a great way of... Uh, he liked the idea and he liked the characters and he thought he could develop this. It's not as if I ever did anybody any harm or anything. I'm just an old who's small, I strike an established clerical grade. Oh, it's really too silly of people. Noggin did become the vehicle by which he, he became much more overtly political. Uh, you know, in Noggin and the Fire Cake, it's hard not to read a very particular kind of address of the, the way in which the atomic bomb was being referenced and the way in which people with military power and with atomic power could be hugely self-destructive. Look out! Look out! Oliver was a conscientious objector at about 1942 when he became of age to be conscripted. I suspect more it was a mixture of family history and also a, a slight innate rebelliousness and anti-establishment thing that he kept all his life. His grandfather was a pacifist politician, George Lansbury, and he said, as far as I'm concerned, you can, you can put away the, um, the machines of, of war and, uh, and, and all of it and just let the world do its worst. And then you had his father, Raymond, was going to be taken out of Oxford and at one time shot for being a conscientious objector. And then you had Oliver. The big mountain. You do not look so sad. So they'll be all right. And they will have flown home. Talking, I made these. It is your rose garden. Oh, that's just what I wanted, a rose garden. I have a theory that um, Oliver and I both needed each other very badly because we're both second sons. And when you're a second son, you somehow rely upon your big brother to help you out in things, you know, and you're sort of always... And I always think that... Um, I was never able to get on very far with my on my own with things. Oliver did various had various attempts at uh, you know various sort of inventions and and uh, sort of jobs and things like that, but nothing seemed to happen very much until we got together and then we sort of sparked each other off. All that used to be my studio, that whole block there. But this bit now belongs to the horse. All I've got there here is glorified cupboard. 
where with all the bits in it. Look, there's 40 years of assorted tins. I haven't the slightest idea what's in them. One day I'm going to have to go through that lot. But not for the moment. It's it's a burden on my conscience, this lot. It's got to go. Oh, this is the, the joy of my life when I made it. This is a, um, a resistance device, and it did a 40-frame dim. Every time I clicked the camera, this turned around once. So the, the light gradually went down, and then when it came to do it again, I reversed the rubber band on this, and it gradually came up again. All made of the Mikado and bits, yes. This is the press button. Click, 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 click. That connection there made all the other engine films. <laughs> and when I was wanting to leave the camera running, I turned it on its back, so it went on clicking until I came back. <laughs> yes, that, that was, this was my, the instrument I had in my hand for years. Strange looking back, because I haven't touched it for 15 years. It's, um, it's just decay all around. We will tickle it every little bit of it. We will fix it like new, new, new. He'd be ankle deep in film, you know, and it had a very characteristic smell to it, you know, he'd sort of go in there and, and he'd be sort of, apart from the focus of what he was doing in particular, it was, to the, to the, the untrained eye, a complete, complete chaos. <laughs> They're usually penguins in the big barn, but of course it's no use charging in there looking for them because they would hide. Look, there's one. It's Penny, I think. Yes, that's her. She's looking for something. She's looking straight at us now. Keep very still and quiet, and perhaps she won't notice us. My sister, Gloria, who knitted a toy for one of my children, a penguin doll, and it had been lying around in the house and one of the cats peed on it, so it had to be washed. <laughs> poor thing. So it was hanging on the line by its beak. This poor old penguin was hanging on the line, pegged by its beak. And uh, Oliver came one day and looked at it and it gave him this brilliant idea of, of a story about penguins. So the films opened with small penguin running down the garden, shouting to Papa Penguin, hanging on the line saying, Come on quickly, Papa, Mother's laid an egg. And Father says, I can't come. Can't you see I've just been washed and I'm not dry yet? You must come, you must come. Mama has laid an egg. What do you say? Mama has laid an egg. Oh, well then. These characters would be moved frame by frame around the yard. And of course, you can see that if Oliver walked up to them and back again, his footsteps would show in the grass. So you'd see these strange ghostly footsteps around the place. The other thing, of course, is the sun would be going in and out. He'd spend hours waiting for the clouds to pass so he didn't have shadows. I never got the feeling that he was a great townsman. I think he preferred the countryside. In that way, he was part of a very important movement in children's literature that's always gone to the countryside ever, you know, and taking its uh, roots from Wordsworth onwards, that somehow the countryside is real and good, whereas town life is artificial and has bad aspects to it. And so, you know, he would he'd be celebrating a whole, this whole part of the rural um, retreat, which has been such an important part in, in British imagination. What are they doing? They're fixing a piece of string on Mr. Pogel's notice board. Thing to do. These are still shots for uh, the Pogles, where um, Oliver used. Um, that might be me, actually. Us, just got basically. Shot, the, the children, the Furman children, the Postgate children, and the White's children from up the road to uh, the play the parts rather than yes. getting in. Uh, that's you know, that's David White there. Professional children actors.
that's me. That's the Fairy Queen. That's Katie Furman, and that's uh, Matthew White. I mean, it's fun, but there were quite long periods where you felt quite bored as a little child, you know, or you were, you'd stand over here with a, with a cardboard box on your head for uh, 25 minutes. The thing I noticed many years ago about my dad's and Peter's worlds is that the, they're always about family values, and they're always about sort of very simple, straightforward, uh, quite humdrum lifestyles. But they're always put into a uh, into an exciting sort of unusual and sort of fantastic con uh, um, situation. So I mean, the Clangers are a family, but they're pink creatures that live on the moon. The Pogles are a family, you know, but they're little tiny characters who live in the woods. Oh, I say. Oh, Pogle, isn't that pretty? Did the Pogle seems to be playing out the everyday life of woodland folk, but it's not really quite like that. There are many kinds of uh, strange, almost supernatural phenomena going on, the presence of witches, the presence of a kind of magic, the way in which you know the world suddenly can be turned upside down on, on a whim. Hello? What's that? Look, what on earth is it? An old boot. Walking along by itself. Open up there in the name of the law. In the name of the law? There's a strong sense that these stories, they're reaching back to very deep British folkloric roots, which are quite challenging in terms of the way in which they produce characters and quite uh, dark storytelling. Come on, open up there, Mr. and Mrs. Bogle. <laughs> You've got things in there that don't belong to you. Open up now. It's you. I love the idea that they're living in their, their tree and they're having to kind of battle the forces of um, evil. Because <laughs> it's quite, there's something very dark about it. They really are in jeopardy. And, you, and so although it's rather funny and, that, and it's, you know, beautifully done, I think the episode I watched recently was with the witch had conjured her, she was a shoe and she was come to attack them and break into their house and you know so there's real jeopardy you definitely feel a bit worried for them <laughs> there now you might have saved me all that trouble by opening the door in the first place you're a horrible thieving hag and you won't get anything from us not whatever you do to us be silent woman the BBC found the witch a bit alarm, which was very alarming, really. I mean, it's like a terrible nightmare, really. You try to get rid of this nasty character, and she comes back as a boot or a bottle or something else, and knocks at the door. Oh, it's it was really frightening, I think. And um, the BBC felt it was too frightening for the little ones, but they liked the character, so they suggested that Oliver did a series of sort of nature films with the Pogles in Pogles Wood, and the witch was never seen again. Children are often underestimated, in my view. They're not wanting to be fed wholly safety in their storytelling. What they want is challenge often, and not merely challenge, but something which might affect them really quite emotionally. That's it! That's the crown! I want it! The witch character, which can come across as very brutal, very frightening, but very challenging at the same time, is about that fear that children really enjoy. They like to feel frightened sometimes, so that they can recover from that. That there can be the reassurances of the Pogles thereafter, the reassurances of the pastoral idyll. Hag of the night, dream creeper. Be no thing at all. Be nothing. She's gone then. You are the bravest and fiercest little seahorse I ever saw. And I'm sorry I took the sea without asking you. But you needn't look any further. I wish I could. Mermaids can't swim deep until they are crowned. I have to stay near the surface so that I can come up for air to breathe. Three of them out of one hat. sort of froggy things, aren't they? 
he marked the point where he became interested in politics as the point where his father died. And I think he felt like he sort of inherited this sort of uh, sense of um, having to be responsible uh, in, a, in a larger sense, which is interesting. He told me that sort of recently before he died himself. I don't know if that's to put some sort of onus on me, you know. This was a time when some people thought there was going to be a revolution. There were minor strikes taking place. The Heath government clearly didn't know what to do in the face of of all this industrial unrest and so on. And Oliver, as I seem to remember, he did some... He, one of the instalments of the clangers had an outfit who turned up and said that yeah, they had to vote for Froglet, I think it was. The noise? Well, that's the election campaigns of the political parties. Yes, uh, political parties, you know. Um, people who think a particular policy is in their own or the country's best interests they call themselves a political party. What for? Well, so they can have a cause. They can act together to defeat other political parties and get what they want. Don't you understand? Oh. Well, I wonder how I can explain. Postgate's politics were always kind of embedded in these films. They were not about over message making. So by the time we get to the early 70s, uh, it's quite clear that when Postgate makes vote for Frobler, he's completely exasperated because he's actually feeling that he's got to make an explicit political message. Free soup for all. Yes, that should catch the votes. No soup for froglets. Dear me, you do learn fast. It's a film that's concerned with the way in which kind of electioneering is taking place. But its bigger message, far more important message, is his deep concern that party politics are actually undermining the idea that governments govern. And who is to give the casting vote? Mother Clanger. Yes, it's time to vote. Yes, you must. But I can't help that. It is your civic duty to vote. Unless people collaborated, cared for each other, and cared for the country, then we were going to go into great industrial decline. In fact, on their own, people can be as loving and generous and tolerant as clangers. But political parties can't. I mean, anything like that is just weakness in a political party. I mean, listen, who ever heard of political generosity? It's, it's a complete contradiction. Party politics is a question of power. And, hey... Are you listening to me? Bagpuss, of course, acknowledged as the greatest children's program of all time in a recent poll. But it's a very nostalgic, backward-looking idea that sets itself up in relation, obviously, to a child's imagination and the way that a child imagines the actions of a saggy old cloth cat, Bagpuss. Once upon a time, not so long ago, there was a little girl and her name was Emily. That's my bed. old bedroom. Yeah. Oh. That's looking out. Look at them all. Oh, my that's old the gate. Were you seven when we did this, or were you? Was it? Well, that's what I've always, I've always been led to believe. That I was seven. Yeah. Because of these photographs, people often think I'm going to be in my eighties, and they're very <laughs> disappointed that they haven't got a cuddly granny to <laughs> come and talk to. To so it is quite strange. Oliver took loads and loads of photographs, and when he chose the right photograph, and he marked us up with a china graph, and that would be the one which um, would be used for the film. Uh, then the photographer would go away and make a vignetted copy of that photograph. And she had a shop. There it is. He was pretty much around all the time, really. I mean, he was here when we got back from school. 
and it was a regular thing taking him a cup of tea at half past three, half past three, four o'clock. Yeah. And you'd hear all these strange noises coming from the studio. Beck was losing a box nowadays. Come on out then. Come on in. There you are. You haven't moved since I last saw you. Must be a reason for that. There he is. Oh. If I can meet him. <laughs> well, yes, he wakes up and usually yawns, doesn't he? And when Bagpuss wakes up, all his friends wake up too. The mice on the mouse organ woke up and stretched. Yes, it was strange because I did drawings of this cat. It's a marmalade cat. But before I had, I had to get the material made because I just could not find a stripe, the right sort of thickness. So we got this company that would make me some striped material. When the man finally came along, he said, I'm afraid we had a slight um, mistake in the kiln. Something went wrong and it turned out and he brought out this great piece of pink and cream material instead of marmalade coloured and I looked at it and I was a bit taken aback for a while and then thought well that's unusual I've never really thought of that and it was a total a beautiful accident really because he is famous as the pink striped cat <laughs> what a pretty story what a delightful story Oof. absolute rubbish every word of it but quite delightful and you, Bagpuss? The interesting thing about Bagpuss was a sort of there's an interesting analogy with that, which is that uh, it's an idea of uh, of comparing Bagpuss and everybody in in Bagpuss as being in the pub. It's a bit like that because you've got the um, you've got Yaffle, who's the who's the bloke at the bar who who knows everything about everything. Yep, yep, yep. It's not only sad; it is silly. It's not only silly; it is not true. It is all nonsense. And you've got uh, Madeleine, who's the good time girl who likes to have a bit of a, a laugh and a sing song. I'm just Madeleine, a doll made of scraps. You'll find me in a cupboard or a box, perhaps. If my and then you've got Bagpuss, who tells the stories. If you buy him a pint, he'll tell you a story. So there's this wonderful sort of analogy with uh, sort of Bagpuss being a sort of like a like a pub situation, really. Stop, 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 stop. This is getting very silly. Too silly. I will not have anything more to do with you until you are properly serious. Yep, 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 yep. Come on, mice. There's a roll of music somewhere. <coughs> Organ. We'd always had Vernon Elliott writing the music for things like the clangers and, and over the engine and that sort of thing, but we felt with um, the new series, which the, this uh, set slightly in uh, a past times and uh, rather nostalgic, we should have a different sort of music. The bony king of nowhere, he sat upon his throne. He didn't much like sitting there because his throne was his throne was made of stone. And Oliver found Sandra Kerr and John Faulkner, who were two musicians who played, they could play almost any instrument, played folk music. His throne was made of marble white, the feet were made of gold. It was a royal throne of white, but oh dear it was, it was extremely cold. Oh, I think it was clear that he really loved music. I don't think he particularly had to, had had much to do with the kind of music we played, which was, for the most part, traditional English, Irish and Scots um, dance music or, or traditional song. I don't think he'd had a great deal of experience of it, but he certainly loved it. I'm sure, well, I know, that there was much more music in the film than he'd at first intended. And stop it, so. I really don't know why Miss Emily brings us things like this. So we can mend them, of course, clean them and restore them into the beautiful things they once were. Yep, yep, that's all very well. The whole ethos of Bagpuss, which is about 
using things in a different way or finding broken things and mending them and investing them then with a magical kind of property. Um, I think that was way ahead of its time and frankly I think it was way ahead of us too. I mean John Faulkner and I were very politically conscious young people but our politics only extended as far as where we were going to build the barricades. This much deeper ecological environmentalist kind of approach that Oliver had has only grown on me over the years and I've seen how far-sighted and ahead of its time it was. Oh yes, that is much better. Much, much better. Look at I've sat and watched Bagpuss with children and sometimes they've clocked it and liked it. I've also sat with them sometimes, say my present four-year-old, and he didn't like it. He didn't like Bagpuss's face. He couldn't read it, I don't think, and he didn't like it. And I know that one feeling I had when I was a child and that I didn't like was a form of melancholy. I didn't like poetry that had a sort of unattached melancholy. I just wonder whether sometimes with Bagpuss, some children find a sort of sad edge to it. Even Bagpuss himself, once he was asleep, was just an old saggy cloth cat. Baggy and a bit loose at the seams. In my big tin box here, there's a, a Tyrolean hat. Oh yeah, here are. And there's a... He's got his... Oh, oh no, that's genuine. No, no, that's, 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 that's genuine. That wasn't a thinking cap. That was a, an accolade for his academic distinction. And this was his sailor's thinking cap. Oh, that's right. Which I like. That's the one I like best. That's the best one, yes. When he told the story of the ship in the bottle... is a very anxious, even dangerous thing to be. You see, dolls cannot choose. Dolls can only be chosen. Television, of course, was changing. Children's programming has always had to be responsive, of course, to the commissioner's understanding of what children are like now. What's what's happening on the streets, you know? What's, what's happening with children? What sort of programming would appeal to them? Do we go with the American model, the Sesame Street model, and all the kinds of programming that was beginning to follow through? Or do we go with our pr traditional British models of uh, stop-motion animation, the post-gate firm and tradition, uh, and so forth? I pull that you. Inevitably, some of the kind of wistfulness, the melancholia, the gentleness, the innocence of post and Furman's worlds um, were not going to sit necessarily with the assumed to be more cynical children of the late 70s and early 80s. Postgate's worlds really were, at that point, seemed to be something that were not alternative enough. Though, of course, to look at them, you would never know they were feeling anything at all. But that's how it is with dolls. What? That's not the end of the story. What happened next? He wasn't somebody who was going to take up beekeeping or um, stamp collecting. He dedicated himself to sort of dealing with the problems that uh, he thought were extremely important, such as the nuclear problem and uh, the environmental problem particularly, you know. He found it a very sort of trying and uh, depressing and difficult thing to do, but he felt it was very, very necessary, and he felt like he had to do it because other people were um, fooling themselves and weren't really paying proper attention. And I think, in some respects, it sort of it came from coming from such a strong political background with his his grandfather and his father, and sort of, uh, and he felt obliged to be part of that world as well, really. Yes, I dare say, but whatever sort of story it is, you haven't finished it yet. <laughs> 
true inheritors of Oliver Postgate are probably the Teletubbies, the Fimbles and In the Night Garden because if you think about them, these are strange woolly creatures living in a world that you're not quite sure where they are. In fact, Oliver thought his interpretation of the Teletubbies was that it was a post-nuclear world and these were mutated human beings with like aerials stuck out of their head and like kind of movies going on on their stomachs. I mean, he thought it was utterly weird, which is quite funny, isn't it, coming from Oliver? Certainly from my own point of view, whenever I'm working on a, on a new program, and this is true of Teletubbies or In the Night Garden, and I always sit down with, especially the clangers, but, but the postgate, uh, legacy, if you like, uh, and, and, and watch them. Not to, you know, plunder them for ideas, but just to make that connection with, with the child that I once was, because it's through watching them again that you really see what was important to you. Yes, it's nice to have visitors, but sometimes it's even nicer to see them go. The very fact that they they are so resilient in the culture, everybody remembers them, everybody has them as some sort of cultural touchstone. That itself is proof of, of the value of the work. And that's quite enough from you, Ivor the Engine. Agus gave a big yawn and settled down to sleep. What's that, Skip? Australia's first superstar is coming up next tonight here on BBC Four. Well, I'd better stay where I am then. <laughs> 